Happy Wednesday. I'm Beverly Hosford. This is Aaron Nitschke, and we are on NFPT Live. NFPT is the National Federation of Professional Trainers, and today our topic is hip hinging. So if you are someone who does squats or exercises or you're someone who coaches people to exercise, we would love to hear your thoughts. Do you use hip hinges with people? Do you teach the hip hinge before you teach a squat? How do you teach squats even? I mean, that's always on the table. Um, and if you know anyone that you think would like to be here to share with us, go ahead and tag them and, and share the show. I'm going to send it out on Facebook and Twitter real quick. And we're going to just dive right into hip hinging. Aaron, do you want to start us off with some, I mean, I could show the hip hinge real quick before we start and then you could explain it. How about that? Sure. So yeah. we're talking about hip hinging. We're just talking about, let me see if I'm in the middle here, Whoop, this way. We're just talking about like feet hip width apart basically and teaching people to hip, hinge at the hip. It's almost like a deadlift. Um, one of our trainers, Ian Nimblet, likes to put a bench in front of people's shins to help with that. So that's the move we're talking about. Like to me, it kind of looks like a deadlift. Yeah, it, and, and truly the deadlift is an example of a primary hip hinge exercise. Um, because that's really the motion that's taking place is, you know, if you're using, you know, just a straight legged, stiff legged deadlift RDL, you've got the dumbbells or a bar in front of your body, close to your body, and then you're hinging at the hips. And when you do that, you give those those large muscle groups a chance to activate because that's that's the motion that you use. So when you're bending forward, you're to pick something up off the floor you have to extend back up and your primary hip extensors are your hamstrings and your glutes. So if you don't master the hip hinge, it's, it's a foundational movement in so many things we do, not just exercises, but in activities of daily living. And cons consequently, if, if we don't master that foundational movement, then we see muscle weakness develop and then a client or ourselves are unable to execute those movements and remain flexible in the hips and strengthen those glutes and those hamstrings. So that's, when I'm teaching squats, I always start with the hip hinge because um, the squat's a, a complicated movement. There's a lot going on in a squat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as opposed to a deadlift, there's not as much going on. There's not as many joints involved as there are with the, as there is with a squat. So when I start people out, especially if they're a novice exerciser or they're just not somebody that's really performed that kind of movement, whether it's a body weight squat or it's one with, you know, a 45 pound bar on the back or dumbbells. I will always evaluate their hip hinge ability because so many people have the tendency to drop the, the hips first and bend the knees versus hinging at the hips and then dropping the butt mm -hmm. down towards the floor. So it's, it's just a foundational movement that I think can sometimes be overlooked um, when we're trying to teach or correct poor body mechanics um, so that people can effectively execute that exercise. Yeah, I think it's always a good idea to break down a multi-joint movement as much as possible when you're work doing it with people, just so that you can identify any issues that are going on, like a right to left side difference, or because once you get your, you know, you've got, oh my gosh, I mean, you've got 33 joints in your foot alone. So right there, as soon as your feet hit the ground. Yeah, you have 33 joints in your feet that you can't evaluate them all, but you can look at the inversion and the eversion of the foot. You can look at um, dorsal and plantar flexion of the ankle, and you can look at the, you know tibial rotation, knee flexion, hip flexion, and then we can also look at how much adduction and abduction is happening at the at the hip. So I think that if you can just slow it down a little bit and start with just that hip hinge, I like Ian's suggestion to put the bench in front of the shins to just really keep the person from having their knees travel at all. And even when you do the hip hinge, you're not gonna be able to avoid some foot inversion, eversion, plantar, I mean, your your ankle's gonna have to move. It's all connected and it's all right. gonna move, but that movement can be minimized. And like we talked about last week on NFPT Live with the IT band, we talked about alternatives to rolling your IT band. We really talked about maybe taking a step back from our bigger exercises when people are complaining of knee pain or IT band issues and doing some simple exercises to find out what's really going on at each joint and, mm -hmm. and you know, pulling each joint out and putting a magnifying glass on it because it's really hard to evaluate the body when everything is moving. Right. No, definitely. And I think it just, it just teaches great posture as well. 
which I think is another added value to really kind of simplifying, like, let's go back to basics with clients. It's one thing if you've got an advanced exerciser, but even they can have poor execution in their form. And so if we prioritize that form and we do simple things like teaching a hip hinge or, or teaching a push up, something like that, that still adds value later on um, so that they then understand what it should feel like. Like, where should my shoulders be? They should be back and down. Where should my head be? It shouldn't be flexing all the way forward. Um, and so, yeah, the hip hinge sounds like a really simple thing, but it's pretty incredible how, how it's not so intuitive, it seems like. You know, when you just tell someone to hinge at the hips, it's pretty amazing the variations you'll see across the board. I mean, yeah. some, people, some people will naturally just like, round their shoulders and go forward and, and you don't really want to do that. I mean, if you think about a deadlift, you've got to have your shoulders back and down. You don't ever want to flex that trunk forward and round the upper back. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's pretty amazing if you just just take do a test sometime with your clients, ask them to just do a basic hip hinge and see what their form is like. Yeah, I love what you said about the shoulders and the neck, because when someone squats, usually the first thing we're looking at is what's going on down low and mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a, a thoughtful trainer will look up high as well, but it can be hard to look at everything. So I feel like the hip hinge can back you out of that a little bit and just take a look at what's going on in the upper body. And I just posted in the comments an article that the lovely Haniel, Hannah Danielson wrote about preventing bad posture um, and he training healthy backs. And she mentions the hip hinge in her article as something to use to teach people about better posture because even though we tell our clients that if they need to pick something up off the floor, they should always squat, what inevitably happens, we all do it, we bend over, we don't bend our knees. And so at least having that, that experience and skill to bend over from straighter knees, I mean, the knees are always a little bit bent, I think, for the most part, but just knowing how to do it properly can be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And just prevent injury later on. And you know, the muscles that, that are activated with a hip hinge are the ones that are going to be likely the weakest just because so many lead a, a sedentary lifestyle. We're sitting a lot of the time, whether we're commuting or we travel a lot, so we're on a plane or we're just driving cross country, whatever the case might be, or it's the nature of our jobs. Um, yeah. Those those muscles tend to be very, very weak. So teaching a hip hinge will, will help correct that in the future. And you yeah. can really... And I just would teach it just without weights in general. I'm just... going to disappear for one second. You keep talking. Okay. neck is doing. Sometimes people have a tendency to look up and kind of hyper extend the neck. I have PS, by the way, don't know if I was still alive because I disappeared. Oh boy. Well, <laughs> so I was like, I'll just keep talking. <laughs> looks like come back to me. Yeah. yeah. So I was just talking about teaching it without weights so that you can really teach your clients. Okay. On that upward movement, when you're extending the hips back up, Tighten the butt, really squeeze the hamstrings and the butt to really strengthen them so you can feel where that activation takes place versus just mindlessly bending forward and coming back up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't really activate the glutes and you really have to be mindful of that because when you stand back up, you could be easily just kind of using momentum versus thoughtfully engaging those larger extensors. Yeah, no, I think it, that's great. So you were giving some info on how to actually like engage the glute muscles and yeah. yeah. So getting down to actually how to teach that hip hinge. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 I don't know if, if you disappeared too, but. <laughs> and I can't see anything. Like I have no idea who. Oh, I know you were good. I think you were on. Yeah. I just turned like, off my screen. I paused for a minute going, huh? <sighs> yes. I have a personal training client who showed up at my house a little early. So I had to just go let her know. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. You know, that's the perils of working from home. It is what it is. You roll with it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see. Man Mandy says like you're sitting on a chair, like you're sitting on a chair. 
Yeah, I guess so. Hip hinging. So that would be a great example of how to start someone off on a squat. Um, so you could teach the basic hip hinge first and then dropping, dropping the hips. Cause that's the first thing people tend to do is like, if I say squat, they immediately drop the butt. And that's not really what we want to do. We want to activate first and then start lowering the hips and, and putting a chair behind them can help them understand, okay, how, how low should I go? And not every client's going to be able to go parallel and that's yeah. okay. Everybody has different flexibility, different range of motion. It's, it's not a problem. Um, but yeah, you can use a chair, you can use a bench depending on the height of the seat or the length, you know, how tall your client is. Someone that's got much longer legs right. is going to have a very difficult time getting as low as someone that has shorter limbs. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So you can, I was just thinking too, like, you know, there's the hip hinge. There's also like, you can do, what do you call it? Um, when you just lay on your back and you like flex the, I guess it's like a hip flexion test basically yeah. to see how much hip flexion people have. And you put your hand under the PSIS to see when hip flexion starts and when spinal flexion begins. And there's other little tests like that, that you can do to take a look at some of the smaller movements that go into a squat so that you know what you're working with. Just some of those basic foundational movements are so important and we can get a little bit caught up or even the client can get caught up in, in learning those, those bigger, I want to go, you know, all crazy. And I want to start with the squat and really there's not as much value to to that as just starting at the very basics and making sure that they're executing it correctly so that when they're not with you, they know how to intuitively make those movements happen. Yeah, totally. So we'd love to hear, you know, if you guys are using the hip hinge or not, um, what else are you using? I think this all kind of stemmed from, you know, we we're talking about squats a while ago and we we're just, we've been talking a lot on the NFPT blog about squats this past month and, and it's just such a common exercise. So why not dissect it a little bit and think about all the different components of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and and just to kind of review the anatomy of it a little bit, in a hip hinge, you're flexing at the hips, you're slightly flexing at your knees and your dorsi flexing and you your ankle ideally is inverting slightly or your foot is inverting slightly as you lower to the ground. And then as you come out of the hip hinge, your hips are extending your knees are extending a little bit. Your ankle is plantar flexing. Even though you're not like lifting your heels off the ground, your ankle, if it's not dorsi flexing, it is plantar flexing, something we don't often think about. Um, every time you come out of a squat, you are plantar flexing, even if you're not doing calf raises, so to speak. So you are working all of those ankle plantar flexors when you're coming out of a hip hinge or a squat. And then when you're um, coming out of the hip hinge, you're everting. So we think about the muscles that are involved with those. When you're coming into the hip hinge, you've got all your hip flexors, your knee flexors, your dorsi flexors, and your inversion muscles like tib anterior and um, tib posterior. And then when you come out of it, it's going to be all the opposite muscles. So just something to think about if you're noticing little issues there, you can start thinking about what muscles might be needing a little bit extra strengthening to make the movement more efficient or uh, not maybe not strengthening, but maybe stretching. Right. No, exactly. Good point. And I think it's, you know, even though we talk about certain exercises as being for this muscle group and this muscle group, your body works as a chain. So there's either the prime movers, but then, you know, you've got other muscles that act to neutralize or stabilize the movement. And so it's important to keep that in mind that just because it's targeting this muscle group, it doesn't mean that other muscle groups are not also affected, even though they might not be the ones directly benefiting, they do, they do play a role. So it's important to watch that chain throughout any movement, whether it's multi-joint or not. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, I think we covered that hip hinge full circle today. And if you have any questions about it or thoughts, please share them with us, even if it's after the show. If you found this uh, episode helpful, please share it with other fitness minded folks. We're going to be taking a break for the next two weeks and coming back um, at the end of August with the show. And so we'll see you in two weeks and we're going to be covering um, what like good posture and bad posture actually is and giving some tips for that. And I'm just looking here. August 15th is when we will be we'll be back on the 15th. Yeah. 
Um, and then after that, we're actually not going to be live quite as often. So but we'll be giving you some updates about that when we get there. So I hope you have a nice couple weeks of August. Enjoy the summer. Have some fun. And we'll see you soon. Yes. Enjoy your time.